Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on calcium signaling. Now in this video what we're going to do is we're going to look at excitation contraction coupling in uh, cardiac muscle cells, which is slightly different from how it works in uh, skeletal muscle cells, excitation contraction coupling. And an experiment that was done thousands, oh, well, sorry, not thousands of years ago, about over a hundred years ago, excitation contraction coupling, uh, shows us that um, that excitation contraction coupling in the heart has to be very different from excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscle. And this is the experiment that was done in 1883 by a, a guy known as Sidney Ringer. And it's quite the famous experiment in physiology. I think it was actually done by accident, basically. I think one of his um, lab assistants made a mistake, basically. And uh, it just happened that this mistake led to Sidney Ringer uh, discovering something very, very important. So the mistake was this, that Sidney Ringer had some poor animal's heart. And uh, he was putting it in some jar, uh, well, some sort of, well, maybe some sort of glass container. And uh, basically, he wanted to do an experiment on this heart. So he wanted the solution that the heart was in to have calcium in. But basically, his, um, his um, lab assistant didn't put calcium in this solution. And basically, what happens is if you put the heart into this, um, into this uh, solution containing no calcium, the heart stops beating. So this was Sidney Ringer's great discovery, that if you put uh, a heart in an extracellular solution with no calcium in, the heart stops beating. So calcium is essential for contraction of cardiac muscle. Calcium is needed in the extracellular fluid um, for cardiac contraction. Okay, right, in, I'll put extracellular fluid, ECF for extracellular fluid. Okay, so if you don't have calcium in the extracellular fluid, the heart stops contracting. So that is not the case for skeletal muscle. If you put skeletal muscle in a solution that has no calcium in, you can still get it to contract. And you'll remember that the reason for that is that the calcium that makes skeletal muscle contract comes from internal stores rather than external stores. And in fact, you do not need any calcium to actually enter from the extracellular fluid in order to get the release of the calcium from the intracellular stores. Now, in the case of cardiac uh, muscle cells, it's similar to skeletal muscle cells in that it is not calcium coming from the extracellular fluid that triggers the cardiac muscle cell to contract. It is still calcium coming from intracellular stores that causes contraction. However, the, the, you do need calcium to enter from the extracellular fluid in order to activate calcium uh, release from the intracellular stores, something known as calcium-induced calcium release. Okay, so we're going to now study this mechanism. So, let's say we have here uh, a cardiac myocyte. And cardiac myocytes, just like uh, skeletal muscle cells, have T-tubules in their membrane. So they have indentations of their cell membrane, uh, which allow uh, the cell membrane to come into contact with the depths of the cytoplasm of the cell, basically. Okay, so, basically, uh, when an action potential propagates along the cell membrane of cardiac myocyte, it will propagate down this T-tubule and it will activate, again, dihydropyridine receptors that are in uh, the cell membrane of this cardiomyocyte. So this here is a dihydropyridine receptor, so a DHPR, or uh, it's an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, which means that the alpha-1 subunit is of the L-type, basically. So let me just quickly go over uh, the structure of L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so basically, um, L-type voltage-gated calcium channels consist of an alpha-1 subunit, okay? And I'll draw this like this, which basically has four domains, as I've shown there. Uh, and I'll just make it look more like a channel. Um, so the alpha-1 subunit of, in fact, it's not just L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, it's all calcium channels. 
all voltage-gated calcium channels have this alpha-1 subunit, which consists of four separate domains. However, even though we divide it into these four separate domains, it is one polypeptide which makes up this entire alpha-1 subunit. So it's encoded by a single gene. Now, there are actually loads of genes which all code for alpha-1 subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels. Uh, and um, that these genes are grouped into three main families. So there is the CAV1 family, there is the CAV2 family, and there is the CAV3 family. Uh, and each of these families contains many genes which all code for alpha-1 subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, uh, if you have a, an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, then your alpha-1 subunit was coded by a gene that was in the CAV1 family. And there are four genes that are in the CAV1 family. CAV1.1 through to CAV1.4. So the CAV1.1, CAV1.2, CAV1.3, all the way up to CAV1.4. And these are four separate genes which all code for alpha-1 subunits which are reasonably alike enough to be grouped into a single family. And basically, if you are in an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, it means that your alpha-1 subunit was encoded by one of these four genes. Now, uh, the structure of voltage-gated calcium channels is slightly more complicated than just having an alpha-1 subunit. The alpha-1 subunit is the main pore-forming subunit. This is the, it, You can make a perfectly functional voltage-gated calcium channel with just the alpha-1 subunit. But often, there will also be some auxiliary subunits on here. So, for instance, a gamma subunit and a beta subunit down here, and maybe an alpha-2 delta subunit over here as well uh, to um, alter and modulate the function of this voltage-gated calcium channel. Right, uh, so that's what it means to have an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, or the old name for L-type voltage-gated calcium channels was dihydropyridine receptors because they are sensitive to the drugs known as dihydropyridines. Uh, of which nifedipine is an example, uh, dihydropyridine receptors. Okay, uh, so, uh, basically, when the action potential uh, reaches this portion of the membrane, it causes a depolarization of the electrical potential across the membrane. Now, this is a voltage-gated calcium channel, so when the voltage is, uh, when the electrical potential difference across this membrane is depolarized, this channel becomes active, it changes conformation, and it opens, basically. So now, this dihydropyridine receptor is open, and it's a calcium channel. It allows calcium to move from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. So calcium comes in. Now, just as in the case of skeletal muscle, you have the sarcoplasmic reticulum of this cardiomyocyte positioned nice and closely to uh, the T-tubule. In the case of cardiac muscle, uh, you generally only see one sarcoplasmic reticulum close to the T-tubule. You don't have this uh, two sarcoplasmic reticulum. In skeletal muscle, you had another sarcoplasmic reticulum over here, also on the other side. In this case, you only see these two together. So instead, it's called a dyad in cardiac muscle cells rather than the triad that you have in skeletal muscle cells. Now, the other difference between cardiac muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells is that the dihydropyridine receptor in skeletal muscle cells was actually physically coupled to the uh, reanidine 1 receptor, which was in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In this case, the dihydropyridine receptor is not physically coupled to the reanidine receptor. And furthermore, the reanidine receptor is now a um, reanidine receptor type 2 rather than the reanidine receptor type 1. So this is a reanidine, uh, well, a type 2 reanidine receptor. So type 2 reanidine receptor. Okay, and it's no longer reanidine, uh, reanidine receptor. And it's no longer um, activated by physical coupling with the dihydropyridine receptor. Instead, the calcium entry through the dihydropyridine receptor then goes on to bind to the uh, reanidine receptor type 2, and that calcium binding to the reanidine receptor type 2, that is what causes the release of calcium from uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum in cardio, uh, cardiac muscle cells, basically. So that 
uh, is how you get a massive calcium rise in cardiac myocytes, which then triggers contraction. So this calcium goes on to trigger contraction in exactly the same way as you get contraction in skeletal muscle. Okay, so that's the main difference between excitation-contraction coupling in cardiac um, muscle cells compared to skeletal muscle cells, that you get this calcium-induced calcium release here. That, that, those, you, those words you'll hear a lot, calcium-induced calcium release. Okay, right, so uh, we'll pause this video here and we'll continue this discussion in the next video where we'll look in detail at this type 2 reanidine receptor.